Well, good morning. Uh, I'm giving the talk today. Uh, Brian just got hooded on the weekend, and uh, he's off to the Army Corps in Vicksburg, uh, Mississippi. Um, I'd like to thank also one of my other former students, Fahad Mohammed, who's at RMS, and he's in the audience, and Juan Aurelio for some of the numerical modeling. But I'll be focusing on the experiment. Uh, the largest uh, recorded uh, landslide tsunami uh, in recorded history is still Litia Bay in Alaska. An 8.3 year earthquake along the Fairway Default uh, releases uh, 30 million cubic meters of schist. Um, above the Gilbert Inlet, plunges a kilometer in, down into the bay and creates a wave about 150 meters amplitude, which runs up to 500 meters. Um, and then it still runs up to 200 meters on a mudslide creek and typically over 100 meters in most of the bay. Uh, one boat rode it, and um, two boats, uh, La Perouse, Anchorage, were washed in the Pacific and not seen again. <clears throat> Flying in about 10 years ago, you can actually still see the scar, the haircut um, from the uh, tsunami, uh, the 500 meter on the headland, uh, the 100 meter trim line um, along large parts of the bay uh, in the fall foliage. Originally, though, in 1958, uh, the erosion it wasn't just a matter of stripping and chopping the trees. It was literally erosion down to bedrock, so the entire soil was removed. So it was basically like pulling the carpet out of your concrete floor. Uh, we conducted uh, 2D experiments uh, at ETH about two, 10 years ago, um, doing a 2D slide through the Tia Bay um, with the impact um, recorded with PIV. Uh, highlighting an impact crater, so a supercritical landslide impact, where the landslide impacts about three times faster than the wave propagates away, creates an impact crater, a little bit like an asteroid, of course, not that extreme. And in the run-up, um, because it's a 40-degree slope, although the wave is essentially unstable and would break if there were no headland, um, because it's only about 120 meters deep at the impact site, so a 150-meter wave would actually be beyond breaking criterion, but because the steep slope and the short distance, the wave doesn't have time to break, and the overturning moment is compensated by the uprush along the uh, run-up slope. Uh, so two D experiments, uh, a brief uh, visual from a 3.1 that's very close to the Litia Bay experiment, and you can actually see the wave breaking as it propagates out. This became then a benchmark for 2D uh, numerical model validation. And here you can see a comparison of the gauge uh, between Robert Weiss's model and the experiment, so an excellent fit. But of course, the real world is, uh, the real world is 3D, and it doesn't necessarily take a 500-meter run-up to kill people. 200, meters, uh, 200 times less large landslide tsunami here in Haiti killed three people. That's about the same uh, number of fishermen that were killed in the Latia Bay 1958 event. So if you're unaware, unprepared, even a uh, three-meter run-up can be deadly. Another scenario, of course, are the conical islands. Two very large events in Japan, the Shimabara event, 1792, killed 15,000 people. Um, it was the largest run-up by Tsuchi-san in Japan at 54 meters. Um, Oshima, Oshima here, Sataka sensei's uh, work. Uh, there's an uninhabited volcanic island, but uh, the tsunami killed uh, a few thousand people on Hokkaido. So this then led to large-scale 3D experiments. Uh, here you can see different setups, uh, planar slope and a conical island setup. And you can also see the, the quite involved work in terms of uh, air hosing uh, uh, tons of gravel back out of uh, uh, tsunami basin. Landslide tsunami generator, so very similar apparatus like we had in 2D, was upscaled for 3D. Here we launch about uh, three quarters of a cubic meters, so we launch about 1.3 uh, tons, metric tons. We used a variety of uh, landslide materials, uh, so we used granular materials, and uh, in order to mimic the behavior of a real landslide, uh, we're inherently, although you would have uh, angular material, but so we don't try to match the grain shape, but we try to match the internal angle of friction, the bed friction. In order to do that, uh, we used uh, rounded river gravel, 
uh, for the bulk of our experiments, and then a cobble mix uh, with some of the cobbles, about uh, the largest cobbles in there, probably about head size, to give you some idea on scale of things, um, which is very similar to hummocky features that you have in, uh, in volcanic uh, landslide tsunamis. <clears throat> some differences in shapes that were recorded. Um, typically, the gravel tends to spread a little bit faster, and the cobbles tend, tend to maintain the uh, thickness a little bit longer. Uh, we did some uh, surface PIV on the uh, landslide surface. Not classical PIV, it's more like speckled velocimetry, essentially using the, the, using the uh, gravel surface for a speckled pattern. First scenario was, of course, a far field straight shot into the tsunami wave basin, the wave basin size of an Olympic swimming pool. And then um, a far field scenario in implementing a conical island um, with about 10 meter base diameter into, into, the, into the wave basin. And I'm showing here a conical island experiment. You see the landslide impact. And you can see the edge waves uh, propagating around the uh, island and uh, colliding on the back side. And there's a variety of high points um, along the way. It's, of course, one in the impact side and one laterally to the side of the impact side. It's an underwater view of the uh, landslide uh, going down to the basin floor. And, of course, being granular, it can propagate onto the basin floor. But, of course, the slope change will uh, cause significant internal deformation which dissipates a lot of energy. I see the wave propagating around the island. Um, it comes here, goes around, and then it collides on the, uh, on the back side. And you can see one of the high points on the back side. Um, but there's some other high points as well. Um, OK, yeah, we can skip that. So then the offshore propagating wave uh, is the first thing we, of course, looked at, both for the planner and for the conical scenario. Um, and as you would expect, um, there are some differences between the planner and the conical. But in the, in the straight landslide direction, the difference is very small. There's a little bit of larger decay, as you would expect when you go convex uh, in terms of radial dependency. Next slide. Um, see the impact displaced in the water. And then you can see the collapse of the drawdown the run-up, and the lateral uh, wave generation. In terms of terminology, so you have the first, second, and, and third wave crest, essentially primarily parts of the wave trend that were analyzed. Just to give you some idea here for one example, uh, this is uh, from Fahad's work, uh, planner case, straightforward in the uh, um, straightforward landslide, landslide axis wave propagation direction. You can see the dispersion of the wave train as the wave train stretches out over a very short distance, a uh, very short propagation distance. There's two effects there. One is radial spreading, and then the other one is uh, frequency dispersion, which are active because the waves are typically intermediate water depth waves. Um, here from Fahad's work, uh, for the planner case, you can see the dependency of the wave amplitude for the first crest is primarily on the fruit number. Uh, so that's essentially the ratio between the landslide impact velocity and the wave propagation velocity. So if the number is super critical or larger than one, that means the landslide is faster than the wave. That's typically the case for subaerial impacts, whereas for submarine cases, typically it's going to be subcritical or less than one. Uh, slide thickness is just a ratio of uh, slide thickness versus water depths. Uh, those two primary parameters for the wave height initially. Then the other shape parameters, um, such as the widths and so forth, come in uh, for the radial decay, uh, the R over H function. Uh, the decay with distance, and then the radial decay with the cosine function. Okay, next slide. Wave celerity. Uh, the wave celerity for the first wave, um, so the waves in the wave train are quite different in, this, in, in that the first one is longer than the second one, and the second one is longer than the third one. So essentially, the first one can be very close to a solitary wave in terms of its wave celerity, not necessarily in terms of the shape of its wave profile, but in terms of the, in terms of the celerity. Um, the second one then is quite significantly deficient, the third one even more. 
One of the more interesting features in terms of lands that generate tsunamis, of course, is the uh, lateral run-up, um, because in many cases, in particular in open ocean coasts, uh, there's really not much in the offshore direction unless you have a mega collapse. <clears throat> so there's the uh, run-up propagation uh, laterally and around the island, and then there's the uh, offshore run-up uh, in the forward direction. So first, if you look laterally uh, for a couple of scenarios here, and you can essentially there's, of course, uh, basically three maxima. So for the conical island and for planar cases, the, the first maximum, the largest uh, run-up and the largest strata, is, of course, going to be at the impact site itself. But, of course, if you're at the landslide impact site, then uh, the landslide is going to take care of you, and you don't really have to worry about the run-up. Um, but then just to the side of that, um, there's, in the second, there's a second maximum, and then a third maximum at 180 degrees halfway around the island. And you can see here the uh, characteristic uh, um, run-up envelope on the back of the island. Edge wave dispersion. So looked at a couple of edge wave dispersion relationships, and it turns out that uh, both for the planar and the conical case, uh, Ursel's uh, theorist order actually, uh, actually works uh, works perfectly fine. There is there's really no, no real improvement by going to, by going to higher order relationships uh, such as Smith and Springs to Ursel. Uh, zero to order actually works very well. Okay, then we looked at some real world scenarios. Um, well, this is a scenario here. A landslide I once climbed about seven years ago. I thought it might, be, uh, it might have taken off by now, but it's been creeping since. Um, uh, it's a thousand, kilo, thousand meter drop, one kilometer drop, um, a cruise ship down there on a good day. There are three cruise ships in there uh, right in their line of fire. This could be a hundred meter plus uh, tsunami here. So when I was up there, this was sort of the inspiration to, uh, to sort of uh, put this, try to put some of these scenarios into, into the wave basin. And you can see here a fjord uh, uh, scaled down into a wave basin. And then we move the offshore side, uh, the offshore headland part of the fjord, different locations. <clears throat> if you look at the opposing hill slope run-up, one of the aspects really interesting was that um, what worked very well in 2D actually really works pretty well in 3D as well. So up to 45 degrees, we can actually still use uh, two very well established relationships. Uh, there are the experiments at, at Vicksburg's Army Corps uh, by Hall and Watts uh, more than 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And then, of course, the uh, famed solution by uh, Costas and Alakis for the solitary wave run up. And if we do this with all the run up up to 45 degree incidents, then actually, um, due to refraction of the incoming wave, uh, we get an excellent match. Um, for 3D, even up to 45 degrees uh, with 2D solutions. Okay, then of course comes the time to, uh, to try and find some real world cases, and there are only very few good cases out there. Uh, one of the recent events is the Chihalis Lake in Canada in British Columbia, uh, non tectonic, uh, not a non earthquake triggered, uh, and just a landslide. But um, 3 million cubic meters, relatively small lake. But still uh, more than 30 meters run up, uh, clean cut, hair cut uh, along the lakeshore. And very good data collected in Canada, so LIDAR, basimetry, and so forth. And so we looked, and there's also field survey done. So we also looked at the, uh, we also looked at the uh, data collected, and we try to see if we, if we take the equations that we have, taking the landslide, estimate the parameters, get the wave, figure out the run up. Uh, can we actually get close to the, uh, can we get close to the uh, uh, field survey data? And we actually get within about a 50% uh, confidence interval for the forecasting of the run-up on the opposing shore, which uh, was quite impressive. And then the last component of the project um, uh, by Juan Maria at Texas A&M. Uh, we've also ran some more complicated scenarios like here, a headland-shaped uh, uh, impact site where part of the energy leaks out into the basin and part of the energy gets trapped like in the fjord. And uh, some of these scenarios are now, being, are now serving as a benchmark for numerical models. And you can see a Juan's model and the commercial model and lab experiment in, uh, in comparison. And with that, um, well, in total, there's more than 200 experiments done in three phases. Um, we uh, conclude the predictive equations for uh, tsunami heights, periods, celerities, and all kinds of things, uh, run-up as well. Um, 
practical applications, uh, for rapid hazard assessment, and then of course for uh, benchmarking of numerical models. And with that, I acknowledge Nice, I acknowledge the Army Corps, I acknowledge uh, NSF and Oregon, REU students uh, who were fantastic help uh, since this was a very physical project in terms of getting those, getting those landslides uh, back out every time you're, you're getting uh, more than a metric ton of material back out of the basin underwater in wetsuits. Thank you. We have time for one quick question. Anybody? Quick question, please. Please, please repeat it to me. Yeah, so, so the the experience we've done is, is, as you're right, is for uh, subaerial landslide impacts. Uh, there are certain limitations in terms of the wave basin, the water depths that you can imply there. Uh, practically, you can only work uh, with about 1.35 meters water depths, which is really very little water depths in the wave basin for, for, sub, for submarine uh, uh, landslide, landslide experiments. After that, the water will go out in the parking lot. There's very practical implications why, why at, the, at the given stage, we tried it actually when we started filling and then we had all kinds of water going all kinds of places. Um, and then I was told that uh, 135 is the max. So that's the max in terms of water depth. So some limitations there. Yes. 